Welcome into K State Online. I'm Mason Both. That is Derek Young, and uh, we are here for another edition of the KSO Show, continuing uh, everything that we bring you on a day to day basis surrounding K State football, basketball. And uh, if you want to go and see anything that's already gone on this week, obviously we got a lot of basketball coverage from Monday night still uh, worth your time if you haven't seen it yet. And then uh, plenty of football coverage, something every day for you there. Uh, Drew, kind of making him do it all uh, right now for us there. Uh, I just throw questions at him and he's got answers. So he's a man with a plan and uh, he's executing. So you can get all that on the K-State Online YouTube, but also make sure you go to kstateonline.com because you're going to get a lot more there. Uh, and look, I, I think, uh, if, if you want to be in the know and stay up to date, uh, and you're not lost, uh, when you're talking to, you know, whoever on the street about K-State sports and they bring something up, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. You'll know if you were at K-State online, or you're just going to sound like, uh, some of the uncles in my family that are like two months behind schedule in the news cycle at K-State. So, uh, that's my endorsement. You won't be like one of my uncles, uh, if you're a member of K-State online. D.Y. and I are here today because uh, we're going to continue kind of looking at some of the questions and things going on around K-State football as spring ball gets ready to start. Uh, we're less than a week away from the first official practice, and one of the major topics on this team this season, Avery Johnson, has been one of the key parts of that, but maybe more important than how a, fre- a sophomore is going to handle his first starting gig is the guys protecting him and how K-State kind of had to retool their offensive line because you lose a lot of guys with a lot of experience that won you a big 12 championship and you're going to go and rely on guys that aren't necessarily inexperienced and you know underprepared here but they haven't played as much as the guys before them and there is going to probably be an adjustment period so what do you expect this offensive line to look like in 2024 and is it going to be uh, they work themselves into it where game two, they're getting cussed out by people because Tulane's manhandling them. And then by game 10 uh, against Cincinnati or whoever it is, people are like, you know what? The offensive line is actually not the problem anymore. You probably spelled it out perfectly. And and that's kind of not to that extent, not to those extremes, I don't think. But that's kind of been like the the theme of Connor Riley's offensive line, even when he has like really good offensive lines, I, I think sometimes because it's such a chemistry group, a cohesion group, you can have three like elite players, but if they don't work well together, it doesn't really freaking matter. And it can still be awful as a group. Like the offensive line is kind of weird that way. And you could have five very average guys, but, but if they are perfect with one another, then they're, they're an elite group. So really that meshing and that, just how they function together is almost more important sometimes than the actual individual talent and skill level. So that's why it's hard to project too. Like if you even think about it from recruiting to college, high school to college, when recruiting experts and scouts are doing the rankings, like offensive lines, the toughest one to do, they're going to get that wrong more than anyone. And even NFL coaches, when they're drafting guys, they get that wrong position wrong more than anyone. So it's a tough, position to gauge but I I think you're right that if there is growing pains and I assume that there will be a few um, if there are challenges and I assume they will be a few a lot of that will come in the first few games especially since you're kind of tested pretty strongly right out of the gate I know it's a group of five school but I bet Tulane is a pretty good front Um, that probably mirrors at least some of the lower end big 12 teams that you play so uh, that's a test, and you get that in week two, and you follow that with week three in Arizona, who might be one of the more talented teams that you play. Now, I think they are more talented on offense than defense, but I, the way Jed Fish was recruiting there for a minute, I bet they got some dudes on, on their front as well. And then the first part of your Big 12 schedule is all, also you're probably your toughest or, or at least the rockiest in terms of how it is fitted and slotted. So, yeah, I, I'm – I'll, I'll summarize it this way. I'm not concerned about them as a whole. I'm a little leery of the front half of the schedule being the, the toughest when that is probably when they'll be getting their footing, trying to get their footing the most. Yeah, it's a good point. that The the start of the schedule, it's not like, obviously we know it's Arizona is, is talented. They bring guys back, but like you said, coaching change, some other stuff going on there. The things that surround that, though, it's at Tulane, which 
Tulane's not going to be as good, I would think, as what they were last year and certainly not the year before that. But it's a road trip to a G5 school that can be a trip up spot. And then you know, BYU is picked towards the bottom of the Big 12 right now if, if you look at what all the odds are saying. But that's, again, that's a road trip, new place. You're oh, going to time zone, like a lot of different things. And in addition to that, like BYU, even when they've had struggles, they are typically pretty good up front on both sides of the ball. Yeah, and let's be honest, the, the offensive line for Kansas State in that game is probably going to be blocking 30-year-old men, basically. I mean, yeah. it's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, Spencer Johnson, the basketball team, is is uh, closer to being 30 than he is to being 20. Uh, so, yeah, it makes sense. And look, th this is an offensive line that uh, you have guys that are experienced, but in terms of the most experience at this stage, in, in actual okay. game situation, it's probably Hadley Panzer. Uh, and yeah. then you you bring in one really big get in the transfer portal in Easton Kilty, and then you're just kind of hoping that Taylor Poitier is ready to stay fully healthy in a year where he's probably going to be, you know, he's going to have a full time job there this year as opposed to you know last couple of seasons it's he's maybe. had health and other stuff going on. Yeah, maybe right. Um, it depends on where those pieces fit. He's going to play a lot, but he he played quite a bit last year. And he stayed healthy, which was great. And hopefully he can do that for a second year in a row. But let's we'll put it this way. Like, they like Andrew Line Gang. Andrew Line Gang could grab a guard spot and, and Taylor Portier becomes a sixth man again almost. Uh, or Taylor Portier plays center. Or Hadley Panzer plays center if Sam Hecht is not your starting center. And you're and then you think, oh, you know, what, what do you do at, at tackle? Well, Easton Kilty can play inside, but he can also play tackle. And a guy we haven't mentioned yet, Carver Willis, played a lot of tackle last year and really improved as the year went along. And John Pastore. Yeah, and so uh, a couple of those guys there, Line Gang and, and Pastore, are dudes that I feel like their names have uh, been floated around KSO message boards or you know group chats for a long time about like this is what they could. But we've rarely seen them on the field. Are they? Is that because? the hype is greater than what the the production was ready to be or is it because the guys ahead of them were just so good i think it's the latter and and obviously i'm i'm kind of a glass half full positive rainbows and sunshine kind of guy so everyone's like oh, of course he's going to say that i get it that's that's me but like you're not going to take kt leviston out like he's he's going to play in the nfl next year he's good and then on the on the other side it felt like there was times where John Pastore, you would have thought maybe he got a shot. One thing is, at some point, he's got to be – it's hard to know this when they're not regulars, and so it's not front and center. But for each of the last two years, at times, John Pastore has been banged up. So he's kind of – now, it's not front-page news because he wasn't in the rotation – but he's kind of got to buck that Taylor Portier thing, the bad luck stuff, because he's kind of, at least early in his K-State career, even before he kind of gets into that first group, he's been a little bit of an injury pro. With Andrew Line Gang, it's like, it felt like he could have been, you know, that six-man type of thing. But there again, you had Taylor Portier came back. Hadley Panzer was, you know, comfortable in his spot. And obviously Cooper BB is an All-American, so... Some of it was by circumstance, I think, for both of those guys. Another angle of this to, to consider, and, and it had been floated to, to me before, too, is they had all those guys that they already trusted, kind of. And it's not that John Pastore and Andrew Line Gang weren't good enough or couldn't have went in and contributed, but I think sometimes it's just like you, you want to, as a coach, you, I, I wouldn't say trapped, I don't know if the right word is, but sometimes you wait too long to just throw a guy into the fire and to give them an opportunity to win your trust. Mm -hmm. With Andrew Line Gang, I think he's good enough and just hasn't got a shot for one reason or another. I think the circumstances of guys in front of him, like Panzer, Portier, um, and Cooper BB, all three of those pretty good players. But also it's just like you I understand that they have to prove themselves, but you have to give them an opportunity to prove, prove themselves. So there's that, you know, that tug and pull there where sometimes you just got to throw them into the fire and see what they do and let them prove to themselves that they can be trusted. John Pastore, a little bit of that too, probably. But 
I think mostly injury stuff. So either way, I think how those two go this year could dictate the direction of the offensive line. But obviously having, you know, Taylor Portier, Hadley Panzer, Carver Willis kind of strengthens your base and at least gives you, uh, you're not starting from the bottom. Yeah, and w- with the way things are going to to shake out, then I also think there's a part of you know trying to work guys in where the offensive line. I mean, it's it's the most of any position you're going to have on the field at one time. You have five offensive linemen out there. They truly have to to work together, and there has to be a familiarity and a trust that goes with it. And I think experience plays a, lo- a large role in that. And I think. Uh, that's what the last two seasons has been for K-State, where maybe at the end of the day, some of the guys that were still out there weren't you know, in the top five of most talented offensive linemen that K-State had, but there was a trust factor, and the other guys on that line trusted them and were bought into it as well. And I, I don't think you want to disrupt it because you're far from the offensive line being the problem. So when it's not a problem, you, you should just not mess with it and fix it. And that's why I think your setup this year, it's, it's not going to be as big of a deal because – I think that's the reason why guys were waiting in the wings, not necessarily they couldn't get on the field because of talent. Yeah, I mean, do, are you more here, – here's the thing. A more talented offensive line even last year could have been left to right, KT, BB, Panzer, Line Gang, Duffy, right? That That's a more talented group. But just because they were more talented doesn't mean it's more effective – than the one that they trotted out there. That I mean, you like it's kind of what I said in the first part, right? There is a difference with offensive line. The five most talented guys is great, but there's a chance because things work differently in the offensive line. It's not just like get dudes out there, get the best players out there and go. You still want talent, don't get me wrong. But a lot of how an offensive line works and how good they are is how they play with one another and how those pieces fit. So once you have the pieces fit very well, you might not want to play with fire just to try to slide in a really more talented player when you know he's already on your roster and he's raring to go for the next season. I think that's a little bit the case here. Andrew Line Gang probably was, or I at least could make an argument uh, based on what we have heard and what we know about him as a prospect. Was he one of your five most talented players in the last year or two? He probably could have been, or at least he's in the discussion. But he has a hard time getting on the field. Why? Because there was already that marriage, that cohesion built with the offensive line. Yes, there's times where people can be frustrated with Hayden Gillum uh, and, and other guys that aren't up to speed on, on certain plays, and I get that. But at the end of the day, sometimes it's not just about that. It's also about how they work with one another because Andrew Langate could be great, but if he doesn't work with them as well as Hayden Gillum, then you're you're downgrading, and obviously they don't want to do that. Now you have an entire offseason, though, to get him infused with those players, and maybe you don't have that gap. In terms of depth of this offensive line, because I think finding the five guys that will start for you, you feel like you're probably in a pretty good spot. But once you get beyond that, then you do dip your toes into a little bit more of a a group of guys that are going to be inexperienced. So how confident are you in what K-State can do there? And also, we've seen, you know, a a good number of offensive linemen come into the program the last two years through recruiting. Offensive line is such a developmental position, but are any of the really young offensive linemen going to be in a position to where you think that they could remotely see the field in significant action in 2024? I think you have three tackles that they're probably prepared to trust. Not to say, I don't know who's the starter, right? That That's probably something that they'll iron out throughout spring football or even wait until fall camp. But I think you got three there with Easton Kelty, Carver, Willis, and John Pastore. So w- would you like to maybe add a fourth possibly? And, and perhaps that fourth is Drake Beckwith at this point. Um who was good early on and probably a limited ceiling there. But I think you still feel good if you have three tackles that you can trust in Kilty, Willis, and Pistori. Now guards, I think you have three guards. You probably feel the same way, right, between Panzer, Portier, and Liongate. So I feel like you kind of have that 
reserve at both the interior and at tackle. So depth, I'm, not, I'm less concerned about. Even if Sam Hecht is your center, I think you got both what uh, Panzer and Portier that could probably do it in a whim um, to be your, your emergency guys behind him. So more concerned about the production and how the starters mesh, especially early on in the season, than I am depth. In terms of young players, I think they're high on a couple. Um, obviously, they were very excited when they landed guys like Caden Massey and Gus Hawkins. Um, I think Devin Voss, was, who is going to be a retro freshman, was slow to kind of get infused into everything. Has, has come on a little bit. Candid BB's just been de dealing with injuries. So even that retro freshman class, not, not necessarily ready yet, I would say. So if you're talking freshmen, the new guys, or even the redshirt freshmen, um, no alarm bells going off, but I don't think any are ready. That's kind of what I assume, but uh, I knew people would probably be uh, thinking about it and like, well, aren't, aren't we getting a pretty good crop of offensive linemen? In? You are, but again, like this is – this is not like running back or even, you know, receiver like, you know, Jace Brown was able to pop off last year. But it, it seems like K-State's in a good spot moving forward. And, and obviously, Connor Riley has, has made things work out pretty well since he's been here with what he's had. And he's typically done it with one really talented offensive lineman that can kind of anchor things. And then you kind of get some other guys that slowly become a steady piece and really reliable and uh, that's how they've built a pretty strong offensive line. So another thing on the offensive line, will their job be easier or harder having Avery Johnson at quarterback instead of Will Howard? Because I think back to, you know, uh, Russell Wilson, the end of his Seahawk days where his Seahawk offensive lineman would complain about they never knew where he was going to be because he's always moving around back there. Is the mobility going to be a good thing or a bad thing for covering up deficiencies uh, in the offensive line? Yeah, it, I mean, it's going to be a, a work in progress, right? So you you kind of said it at the beginning of your little diatribe there, but it comes down to I, and I know some people get a little impatient with him at times, in pro, and, and I think that's just fandom in general, and I get it. But, like, ha have a little grasp of reality here, folks. Connor Riley is probably one of the best offensive line coaches in America. Now, We'll see what it's like when he also has to call plays. What's what's kind of the seesaw battle there? Is there is there a give and take? I hope not, because I I really do think that he's one of the best offensive line coaches in America. Not to say that Cooper BB wouldn't have become as successful with another coach. He could have, but I have a hard time thinking that anyone could have got him to reach the highs that he did than Connor Riley. Um, there's very few out there. Uh, to me, he's a top 10 offensive line coach in America. I'd be surprised if there's more than 10 better than him. And, and I think that uh, that sends this group a long way. I mean, you have to remember, everyone has to remember, year one under Chris Klein, and I, I, what, that team went eight and four, right? <laughs> and lost the bowl game, I believe. Um, oh, yeah, that, that bowl game was pretty painful. But he inherited obviously the group that he had and he had five senior starters and everyone was like, Oh, you know, that next year, like this is when we'll know about Connor Riley. There was no drop off. He went, he lost every single starter from his first year. So you, you look, you're, you're losing an, an NFL day one starter and an all American in Cooper BB and, and another NFL guy in KT Leviston. Like it's, it's not going to be easy, but I just think back from that year one to year two. Um, I just don't, anticipate there being a drop at least a considerable or noticeable drop off that's probably good for people to hear right now Con connor riley i think at times uh offensive line is one of those positions where people know the least about it and so it's either really easy or really hard to criticize and so when things aren't going well you just say oh well the offensive line and look the offensive line has been bad at times in games and you can say yes they've been bad but i think there are other times where a lot of people like I I I could not break down offensive line for you. And I think there are a lot of people that know the game of football really well that even they couldn't do it because there are so many intricacies that go with it. But at the end of the day, the consistency and the product that has been put out there by Connor Riley proves it. I think you make a good point about hoping that his obligations as the play caller 
doesn't detract from what he can do with this offensive line unit every single game. Yeah, and, it would, and if it did, it would probably show up on game day the most because um, I think you'll be in those rooms and, and developing them an entire offseason. I don't think you'll lose anything that. It's just when, <laughs> when he's up in the booth, that, that's a challenge in itself a little bit, and it helps Brian LePac does have an offensive line background. But like offensive line coaches are almost always on the sideline. Those are guys that like you have to have that connection, that interaction. So – not having that hopefully doesn't have a huge effect. Again, I think K-State is probably blessed the way that their staff is composed that they still had someone like Brian LePac to maybe, again, bridge that gap to. All right. Well, that sounds good. That's the book on the offensive line that is going to try and get itself back into its normal K-State form for the 2024 season with a handful of familiar faces but elevated roles and uh, a couple of new ones as well. And We'll see what the balance with Connor Riley ends up being like and everything else because they've got a pretty they got a pretty big job to do creating holes for DJ Giddens who's really good and buying time for Avery Johnson who's really good but on the flip side Avery Johnson and DJ Giddens can help an offensive line out quite a bit because of their talent level and uh, you can you can maybe mask some deficiencies so we'll see what it looks like when it all comes together but we'll get our first looks at it uh, in the coming weeks with spring football for K-State which gets underway uh, next week on Tuesday. So that will do it for Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching K-State Online. Be sure to head over to On3. And if you're not a member of K-State Online, get signed up now. Lots of good stuff going on, uh, especially since you want to be over there and geared up for the road trip to Cincinnati that's going down this weekend. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And we'll be back here tomorrow on Friday with uh, our Cincinnati and K-State preview for the game and also hit on a couple of other things with the Cats as they – continue to claw their way toward the right side of the bubble. Uh, it's an uphill battle, but they're they're going to make life tough on the selection committee come selection Sunday. So we're out of here. We'll talk to you again.